Welcome to the second part of our motivation and organization lecture part. So we have seen a few organizational things about the lecture. And in this video, we are going to motivate why we are interested in channel coding and what methods we are going to use and why this is important to look at. So first, the, our main motivation is communication engineering. That's where coding channel coding in particular comes from that's where its roots are and that's where the main applications are what is communication engineering communication engineering is essentially transmitting digital information between point a and point b and to do this we use physical carriers it can be voltages in a cable can be currents can be electromagnetic waves it can also be acoustical waves which for instance submarines use for communicating underwater. It can be birds, like pigeons, carrier pigeons. It can also be molecules, which are currently being researched actively for communicating with small robots that are inside your body, for instance, for releasing medicine. So we have a bunch of different physical carriers and we use those for transmitting messages. Now, communication engineering looks at methods and algorithms to fulfill this communication task in the best possible way. And the crucial part is how to do this efficiently because we want to have battery powered devices. We want to have energy efficient devices. And to do this, we need efficient algorithms. So what mechanisms and methods do we use in communication engineering? We have seen a bunch of those already in the bachelor in communication engineering one. The first one is to represent the data accordingly. For this, we use something called source coding. Source coding essentially generates a digital version of our data that we'd like to transmit that is best suited for the transmission. We have a separate lecture on source coding, which is why we are not looking too detail into this lecture. Um, what we are looking at is the protection against transmission errors. And the protection against transmission errors is based on a technique that's called channel coding. After we carried out this channel coding, which adds this protection, we need to transmit the data. And for this, we need to impose, superimpose the digital data to our physical carrier. And that's being done using the technique of modulation. At the receiver, we need to estimate back our data. That's being done using estimation theory and demodulation. In this lecture, we'll also look at some simple models of demodulation because that's crucial into getting the data in a way or in a form such that the decoding part that comes afterwards, which is the removal or the error protection, that's channel coding. And besides these more introductory or just besides this very concrete techniques, coding, decoding. We'll also have a very close look at a superimposed concept, which is the channel capacity. Channel capacity identifies the maximum amount of data we can transmit over a given system. So we have a system consisting of a transmitter a receiver. I'd like to know what is the maximum amount of data we can transmit between the two of those. That's what we do using the channel capacity. Then we also have seen in communication engineering some other mechanisms and methods like the channel modeling, the noise modeling, which is very crucial to get a good model of our transmission channel. We have synchronization algorithms that we need to synchronize our receiver to the transmitted data. We need to remove detrimental channel effects. That's being done using equalization. Then we have some more higher level system concepts, like spreading techniques, multi-user techniques, OFDM, MIMO systems, multiple access schemes, network aspects, and so on, which we'll not look at in this lecture. In this lecture, we will focus on the capacity, the coding, and the decoding part. So to summarize, we have channel coding, and channel coding is a crucial and core part 
of every communication system and it's indispensable to guarantee sufficient end user experience. If you use a mobile phone, for instance, you very often get a sufficient end user experience if you download a video or something works quite well. Very often, not always, but very often. And this only is the case because there is channel coding. Without channel coding, you will not be able to use your mobile phone in a sufficient way. Another goal or another motivation to look at this is because channel decoding uses fundamental both machine learning, inference and estimation techniques. We want to learn what data has been transmitted. That's a core idea of machine learning. There's also one of the reference books, the one by David McKay, is called Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithms. And it covers both machine learning as well as coding because the two, the two topics evolve around the same mathematical theory. So mastering channel coding enables an understanding of many other techniques, not only in communication networks, but also in machine learning. One main algorithm that we're going to use, the so-called belief propagation algorithm, essentially originates from machine learning. That's why it's a very important algorithm, which we'll look at in detail when decoding codes. So at our institute, um, what type of research do we do on communication system? Essentially, we do more or less everything. So we start from the theory and look at uh, some theoretical aspects of communication engineering, but we also look at um, how to practically evaluate this theory. For this, we um, very often build up prototypes. So here's a small prototype. That's a laptop running an IoT system in software together with a few antennas. We use this for instance, to do measurements of our systems. We, um, to verify our theory, we carry out a lot of simulations using a variety of programming languages, C++, Python, MATLAB, just to name a few of them that are being used in our institute. So what is digital communication about? Where does digital communication originate from? Basically, Digital communication originates in the 1930s, 1940s of last century, last century, when it was developed mathematically. And one man stands out above all other researchers, and that's Claude Shannon. So Claude Shannon gave seminal contributions to the field of digital communications by completely looking at the communication system in a different way. Before Shannon came around, people essentially thought that reliable communication is not possible, that you will always need to make errors. But Claude Shannon, by having a very clever definition of the basic building blocks of a communication system, which is still relevant today, so we still follow the setup that Claude Shannon defined in every communication system today, he was able to first derive very fundamental performance limits of communication system, but also to say that I give you a technique, coding, that you can use to achieve a virtually error-free user experience. So he said, you need to use coding, otherwise you will not get or are not able to perform error-free communications. He didn't solve everything because he didn't tell us how such a coding system could look like with manageable complexity. In his theorem, where he proved this, he used the Gedanken experiment, where he defined a random coding construction, which you can use, which you can decode on pen and paper. He assumed that there is a there is a machine who is able to decode this code, but this machine has all the possible computing power of the universe at its disposal. And it's not possible to do this even practically. So it is just out of scope. And therefore we need to find 
schemes to build coding systems with manageable complexity. So there is work needed to find those systems. Claude Shannon laid the ground, but he didn't tell us what to do. He just gave the, the boundaries. And based on these boundaries, we need to find the real realizations. So the communication system according to Claude Shannon consists of the following blocks. And this illustrates the transmission, transmission of a message A. So A is our message. We would like to transmit the message. Then the message is fed into the source encoder. So the source encoder carries out source coding and transforms this message A into a string of bits, so a sequence of zeros and ones. It does this in a very efficient way or in the most, the most efficient way. Then we have the channel encoder. So the channel encoder adds so-called redundancy and it protects this sequence of bits against transmission errors. For instance, here's a very simple example by just repeating every bit. And then we have the modulator. The modulator imposes the bit stream after the channel encoder onto the physical waveform or the physical carrier. Usually we divide the modulator into a digital part, the digital modulator, which is the one that is shown up here. And the real hardware physical modulator, which we call the transmit front end. So the digital modulator essentially generates a set of complex symbols, and the transmit front end takes those complex symbols and transforms them onto a physical carrier, physical waveform, elect ele electromagnetic wave, um, voltage, or whatever. And then we have the transmission, which happens in the analog world. We have the received front end, which essentially takes the analog signal and generates a set of complex numbers again. So the set of complex numbers are fed into the demodulator, which generates a bit stream. So in this toy example, we have an error that happens here. We received the wrong complex number. Then the demodulator makes a mistake and the channel decoder makes a mistake. The source decoder does not recover the letter A anymore, but the letter B. And these are the basic building blocks of every communication system today. Every single communication system. A few, there may be a few exceptions where can channel encoder and modulator kind of bound together, but usually you have this very clear separation. So some examples of, mobile, of communication systems, you all know mobile communications, everybody of us has a phone and we have an infrastructure to serve the phones. The infrastructure consists of antennas and what you don't see is there's a lot of processing units that are probably here somewhere under the roof or in the basement. Um, the, these process the data coming from the antennas and there are they are then being fed to a network. So we have a very big mobile communication infrastructure that is ubiquitous everywhere around us. Maybe not so ubiquitous, but still quite ubiquitous is uh, satellite communications. Most of you probably know satellite communications from video broadcasting, from TV. Um, that was one of the first applications of satellites, first analog signals. So we use satellites to relay a TV signal back to the homes. But today the satellites also convey digital information. And recently we have seen the Starlink system that's being put on space by Tesla, uh, not, not Tesla, same founder, different company by um, SpaceX. So SpaceX puts those Starlink satellites into orbit. They provide internet for remote regions. So satellite communications is also something that is pretty important today. Um, at home, you may have a wireline communication system, possibly a DSL line. 
Um, here you can see how these uh, cables look like. So you have these big pools of copper cables that are being put in the ground. Either you have PSL via traditional copper, or you have uh, maybe cable using a coaxial coax, um, which is using similar cables, but different techniques, not twisted pair copper cables, but coaxial copper cables. Then uh, fiber optic communications is also a big part where we use a lot of coding, where we need a lot of coding. Actually, where I worked personally more than 10, 10 years in fiber coding for fiber optic communications. Here is just an example of all the cables that are put into the oceans. That is a map that you can find um, in the internet. There is a web page that is called, if I'm not mistaken, www submarine cable map. Mm. Submarine cable map dot com. So there you can see all these cables that lay in the ocean uh, together with the transmission parameters and you can see the huge amount of transmission rate that is being achieved over these transoceanic cables. And besides that, we have a lot of fiber optic cables that lay on the ground terrestrially to connect the big cities, to connect your DSL system with the next city, metropolitan region networks, campus networks. So on, on the KIT campus, we have a lot of fiber optic cable and essentially they form the backbone of the whole internet infrastructure and of the whole telephone system also. So also if you use a, a mobile phone, so after the antenna tower, the antenna tower, the signal goes to a fiber optic cable and then it's being connected with a regional networking center Then it's being relayed to the destination center. And then only at the very end, it's going back from the fiber towards the antenna. So there we also have a lot of um, fiber infrastructure that is sitting in the background. Then what you may not know, um, QR codes. So if you like, you can take your phone and you can scan this QR code. Let me do this. So I scan this and it points to the web page of our institute. Now I can go ahead and I can change um, this QR code. So for instance, I can erase something here. This was a little bit. Add. So I can erase some data and let's try again. So I take my phone, try again, and still, hopefully still able to recover the data. Let's try. I'm still able to recover the data and erase some more. Let's see if it still works. Uh, now I'm getting stuck. I can still recover the data and there is some point where it will not work. So this is possibly too much and I will not be able to recover the data now with the phone. So there is also some kind of coding inside the QR code and you can erase part of the QR codes without destroying the information that's embedded in the QR code. So in the pandemic, QR codes have become more and more important again. We have QR codes for vaccination certificates, test certificates, etc. And there is a lot of information embedded and there is a lot of protection embedded in the QR codes. So here is a frame structure of the QR code for information. So we have a little bit of data and a little bit of, well, most of it is data and some of it is um, for synchronization. So we have these patterns of um, zeros and ones or black and white tiles that are for uh, the timing so that you can get a grid. Then you have this structure which is for positioning. So you have a slightly asymmetric structure, looks like a triangle. So you know which is the upper left corner always. And then you have some version information that's embedded in these parts. And here you have the data plus some error correction. And the error correction um, can be configured into different levels. We have level 
error protection, um, low, medium, high, and Q stands for quality, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we have four levels of error protection, and you can tolerate from 7% of damage of the QR code up to 30% of damage of the QR code. That's the worst case um, because of the special way the um, message is stored inside the QR code, you may be able to also tolerate more than 30% of the damage. So the, the size of the QR code will change with the error protection level. So let's take a look at some examples. This is a QR code with error protection level L. So this is only 7%. Scanning works. So let's destroy some of the content. See if this is already 7%. I'm not able to recover it anymore. So this already destroys the, um, what is embedded inside this QR code. So let's take a look at level M. So I should be able to tolerate a little bit more damage. Let's take a look now. No, nah, was too much. I cannot recover. So let's go to the next. Let's go immediately to H. So the highest be able to tolerate up to 30% of damage. So let's take a look now. And now magically put my phone, you can try it yourself and you see that you can recover the data that is embedded inside. So if you have a tablet, play around with this a little bit, get a feeling of how much you can correct, how much you cannot correct. And this uh, should give you an idea of the error protection capabilities of QR codes. Um, something where you don't expect coding so much is data storage, but inside traditional hard drives, which you may not find in your consumer devices anymore, but which are still being used in big data centers and data storage devices, cloud devices, and also on USB drives, on um, the um, on SSD drives that you have in your phone and your computer, there is a lot of error protection going on. These things are highly unreliable. These things are very unreliable, but you don't want to lose your data. You don't want a single bit of your data to be flipped, and then you will maybe lose the whole file because it's somewhere in the header. You may lose the operating system on your computer. You don't want to have this. You want data integrity. And data integrity can only be guaranteed if you have strong coding with very, very, very low error rates. You don't want an error to happen in one of those, or here maybe you can tolerate, but not if there is important data on it. So there is a lot of error protection going on in data storage systems. This is an application that's a little bit uh, for the future. Um, visible light communication is also something where we need a lot of error protection. The idea here is to use LED as lights, and uh, by flickering very fast, the LEDs essentially can transmit information which is invisible for the human eye. Also, this is an application where we need coding. So now let's take a closer look at the, the system and let's take a closer look at the different components of this communication system. So what blocks do we have? We have a source encoder and the source and the user may be an analog signal, for instance, speech, music, a video, which is then digitized, or it can be a digital signal immediately, like when you want to transmit a computer file. And uh, the important thing is, according to Claude Shannon, the way we model this is that the sequence of bits follows a probabilistic model. So we don't know the data and we assume that the data is a random variable. So the bits that we transmit, they come from a probabilistic model. And the user is a person, computer, or an electronic device. And this was a radically new way of thinking when Claude Chen came around. Before him, people thought the data we'd like to transmit is something that is deterministic, because we know what we transmit. But that didn't lead to anything. And Claude Shannon, he revolutionized the transmission communications, because he said, I don't care about the content of the data. 
I assume that the data is some probability. And that allowed him to build up a complete theory of the communications that is based on probability theory. And at the time, he received a lot of criticism from his fellows. So people around him said or there was criticism that was even written down as a review of his paper that said, um, I'm very angry that this man believes that I want to transmit gibberish. So people didn't take it seriously. They said, I'm not transmitting random stuff. I'm transmitting something serious. And I want this to be taken seriously. I want this to be deterministic. Claude Chang said, it's random. It's like you are a random number generator and you just transmit random stuff. And this was the really new way of thinking. So it was a radically new approach to looking at things. So that's the source, the user. We assume it's a probabilistic model. Everything is probabilistic. The source encoder then um, conveys the information um, or converts this information to source bits and um, towards a new bit sequence, which is a more efficient representation of the original data. So for instance, it has fewer bits if we want to do compression and the compression can be lossless like a zip file or it can be lossy like when you take an image, you can throw away the parts that we cannot perceive or in a music or videos, etc. So that's the role of the source encoder to compress or represent more efficiently our signal. And finally, we come to the channel coder. We have both encoders and decoders. And the role of the channel encoder and decoder is to protect the bits that we transmit, which are subject to noise, distortion, interference, and to protect, to carry out this protection, we also convert the bits, the input bits, into an alternative sequence that is redundant. So it possesses some redundancy. And the role of this redundancy is to provide immunity. It's providing immunity from channel impairments. And the channel encoder and decoder is characterized by something called a code rate. It's essentially telling us how much redundancy we add or the ratio of redundant number of bits that enter the encoder versus the number of bits that depart the encoder. That's the code rate R. Uh, we will not formally define it now, we'll formally define it later. So here is the channel encoder. Now we come to this formal definition of the rate. So the channel encoder is a device and we're only looking at one specific instance of channel encoders. Uh, let me fix point size. So we're only looking at something that is called a block code. So block codes do the following. At the input of the channel encoder, we get a vector u consisting of k input bits. And this vector u is encoded into a vector x consisting of n output bits, whereas n is strictly larger than k. We can have n equals k, but it doesn't make sense because then we'll need to have, we'll not do any meaningful coding. So we assume that n is larger than k. So we take a block of k bits encoded to a block of n output bits. So k information bits go into n output bits. And we add new bits. These are called parity bits. So the bits that we add are called parity bits and we have n minus k of those parity bits. So what is the rate now? The rate of the encoder is defined as the fraction of input bits to output bits. So here, we always also assume that the input are bits. We only deal with binary codes in this lecture. So in the other lecture, in the Channel Coding Algebraic Methods lecture, if you're interested, uh, if you want to take that one, there we will deal with more general 
um, inputs, outputs. Um, here we only deal with bits. So the rate is the fraction of input bits to output bits, so it's k over n. So when we have a small rate, it means we have a small number of information bits, we add many parity bits, n minus k in that case is large. And if we have a large rate, means we have a small number of parity bits. Number of input bits is almost equal to the number of output bits. So we have many information bits. And usually we would like to have a large rate because we don't want to throw away precious resources. In the end, we have a certain budget of data that we can transmit. And we want this budget to contain as much information as possible. We don't want to transmit parity bits because they don't contain new information. We want to transmit as much information as possible. That's why I would like to have a rate as large as possible. And we will see, this is the so-called channel capacity, how large this rate needs to be, or how large it can be at most. Sometimes we need to reduce it because we are not able to fulfill our requirements. So then let's uh, continue with our description of communication systems. Um, after the channel encoder, we have the modulator and its counterpart, the demodulator. So the role of the modulator is to convert the channel encoder output bitstream into a form that is appropriate for the channel, physical wave form or for the physical carrier. So in a wireless communication channel, the bitstream it must be represented by a high frequency signal or an electromagnetic wave. And this high frequency signal, electromagnetic wave, must be able to facilitate transmission with the antennas that we have. Then the channel itself, that is also another part of um, this lecture that's important in this lecture, because in order to correct errors, in order to protect, we must know what happens to the bits. If we don't know what happens to the bits, then we um, cannot correct for these effects. So we need to have a model of what is happening to the bits and what errors can occur. That's the connection to the electrical engineering part. So the channel is essentially the physical medium over which the output is conveyed. Physical medium, either it's transmitted or it is stored in a storage system. And if we look at channels and communication systems that we have, we know that these add noise and very often also interference from other signals. And then we have a signal distortion that is ever present because of uh, digital to analog converters, because of um, limited bandwidth resources, etc. So some examples of a channel are wireless transmission. Um, we have antennas, high frequency electronics that add noise. We have amplifiers that add noise. We have optical fibers that have very nasty behavior in terms of the, the signal distortion. We have lasers, photodiodes that distort the signal. We have hard drives with read and write heads. We have a magnetic medium um, on um, magnetic storage systems. We have amplifiers, filters, and many more. And um, for instance, CD can be a communication channel, a Blu-ray disc, a simple sheet of paper when you store QR code can be a communication channel. Sheet of paper um, can be, yeah, you can uh, destroy it and you will not be able to read the uh, data on the sheet of paper um, yeah, nicely. So you have a sheet of paper with cameras and barcode scanners for the case of QR codes. Um, the model that Shannon introduced is simplistic. So it does not include parts that are present in today's communication systems like encryption and decryption, like symbol timing recovery, synchronization, um, which we assume to be ideal and we assume to be 
accounted for in the channel models. Um, we also need some time of line coding or scrambling, uh, which we also assume to be ideal and not bother in this lecture. So on the basis of this model, what Shannon did was to introduce um, something that he called the channel capacity. That's a parameter that characterizes the channel. And this channel capacity is a measure of how much information we can convey over the channel. And the capacity is often represented in bits per channel use. So it means whenever we use the channel once, how many bits can we transmit over the channel? And Shannon showed his channel coding theorem. And this channel coding theorem says that we have codes that can provide arbitrarily reliable communication, error rate as small as possible, if the rate of the code is smaller than the capacity of the channel. So if we have a channel with a capacity 0.5, for instance, it means that on average, every time you use the channel, you can transmit less than 0.5 bit. And you, do, you need to do this using a code, and we will see how to achieve this. So he said they, there exist codes such that if the rate is smaller than the capacity, you can provide reliable communication. Now, if the rate is larger than this capacity, there is no way that you will ever find a code. It just doesn't exist. That's actually something that Shannon didn't prove that was proven later. So this capacity is a sharp limit. If the rate is smaller than the capacity, we have a code. The rate is larger than the capacity, there is no code. There is no code that provides reliable communication. You can search whatever you can, but you can mathematically prove that such a code does not exist. So, if, in order to do the coding or the error control coding, there are multiple strategies, and we will focus on one strategy because that's the main strategy. This strategy is the one that was also considered by Shannon, which is called forward error correction or FEC. And here, the error control strategy is a one-way street. So it means we have data, we encode data, we transmit them to the decoder, and the decoder needs to take care of everything. So the decoder needs to take these parity bits that have been added for correction and automatically corrects the errors at the receiver. And you don't want to go back to the transmitter. So for instance, if you have a Blu-ray disc or a DVD or a CD, if there is a scratch, you want to correct for the data. You don't want to send it back to the guy who produced it and then get a new one that just takes too much time. You just want to correct the scratch immediately, and as soon as possible, without having a feedback loop. Also, on a QR code, if you can, uh, you want to recover the QR code by just scanning it, you don't want to go back to the guy who printed the QR code and say, oh, there are some errors, I want a new QR code. So that's one-way strategy. You correct the errors, you don't go back to the transmitter. And this strategy is used in most communication systems, many mobile applications, uh, many fiber optic communications, etc. So that's the main strategy, and that's the one we're focusing on in this lecture. If you have a computer science background with more networking, then uh, you may have seen the automatic repeat request, which is essentially an extension of forward error correction. And here we have a two-way system. So two-way means we can communicate with the transmitter. So we have ARQ or automatic repeat request, which is a two-way system. So what we do is we add, again, parity bits, redundancy, but we don't try to correct the errors, but we use it for detection. 
So we want to detect an error. And if we have detected an error at the receiver, we communicate with the transmitter and say, hey, guy, you uh, I received something erroneous. Can you please try sending it again? And this is the so-called request for retransmission. And second time, you may be lucky and you may not have an error anymore and you may use the data. So why would we use this? Well, we use this uh, if we have very, very low error probability in our transmission channel. So if, for instance, one error per day happens, then most of the time you don't need to do anything. Just detecting errors, is, as we're going to see, is very simple. Correcting errors is much more complicated than detecting errors. So detecting errors is very simple. And um, most of the time, we don't need to do anything. But once a day, there is an error. And then we request a retransmission. And then we'll just take this, uh, this hit and we'll retransmit again. So we have a much lower decoding complexity. But if we have noisy channel, we'll suffer a lot in terms of throughput. So then we need to constantly retransmit and uh, we'll just lose a lot of data throughput. So that's why this is not used in noisy scenarios. There is a third option that's kind of a hybrid between forward error correction and ARQ, which is called hybrid ARQ which essentially combines forward error correction with ARQ. And in hybrid ARQ, you try to correct the errors until a point where you realize that it's not possible to correct the errors anymore. So if the errors cannot be corrected, what you do is you request additional parity bits. So you say, OK, the, the amount of parity bits I have are not sufficient for correcting the errors. Transmitter. Can you please send some more data, some more parity bits, so that I can take care of the errors, that I can correct them? And then you retry. And if you're lucky, you may it may work. If you're unlucky, you request some more extra parity bits. So this is, for instance, being done in your mobile phone. And uh, this is in LTE or in 5G. This is a strategy that is being used. So if you're not able to correct, you just request a few more extra parity bits, and that may be already sufficient to trigger the, the amount of correction. Um, so, so I just need to move this a little bit. I... Okay, so we have hybrid ARQ. And uh, there is also a distinction between classical coding and modern coding. So classical coding, it's called classical because historically it was the first that was investigated. In classical coding, we use algebraic arguments and constructions to construct codes that have very good mathematical properties. And um, very often, there is no decoder or no immediate decoder for such codes. So we have an encoder that is easy to get, but the difficult task is to find decoders. So we actually have codes with very good mathematical properties, but we don't have a good decoder known to date. One example is called Reed Muller codes. They have outstanding mathematical properties, but we don't have an efficient decoder. And currently, it's actually a research project to find good decoders for Reed Muller codes even today, despite the fact that Reed Muller codes were introduced in the 1950s. And with still being researched on, we are very close to having good decoders, but there is still some more work that needs to be done. So the idea here is first we take some mathematical properties to design a good code, and then the engineer is left with the hard task of finding a decoder. So if you are interested in these codes, we have the lecture that is called 
ECAM, Channel Coding, Algebraic Methods for Communication and Storage. That's being done in the summer term. So the summer term in this lecture, we're looking very deeply into these classical coding schemes. And um, there are many aspects. Classical doesn't mean it's outdated. They have a lot of applications. They're still being researched on. It's a very important topic. It's just a different way of looking at it, and it's called classical because it was around first. The modern way of looking at it, that's called modern coding, is just vice versa. At the modern coding scheme, we have a very simple generic decoder, which is the belief propagation algorithm that I mentioned before. Very, very simple decoder. The whole decoding algorithm fits on the one slide. We will have one slide with everything you need to implement a decoding algorithm. Once you have it, you can use it for whatever you like. This is the belief propagation algorithm. It's a very, very simple decoder. But because it's so powerful and so generic, you must find a code that is well suited for this decoder. It's actually a suboptimal decoder. So it's not carrying out an optimal decoding, but it's very simple. And we have shown that there are codes with which you can actually get an optimal performance with this suboptimal decoder, which is quite interesting. So you have a suboptimal decoder, very simple, but you can reach optimal performance with that. So, and um, what we call modern coding is mostly about finding and constructing good codes that are well adapted to this simple decoder. And we have an abundance of design principles. Um, interestingly, the codes that come out of these design principles, they are not good codes in the classical principles. So the very first turbo codes were essentially very bad codes if you look at them from a classical point of view. But they outperformed everything that was there before by using this very simple decoder. So now the task is to construct codes and encoders with efficient implementations that fulfill the constraints posed by the channel and the system design. And then you just use this generic decoder that you can have off the shelf and just plug it in. So that's the difference. Um, nowadays, both schemes are used half-half, I'd say. We have many options where classical codes, many systems where classical codes are being used, many systems where modern codes are being used. We have also a bunch of systems where we use a combination of classical and modern codes, like fiber optic communications, There we use some very clever combinations of these two worlds. So it's kind of merging together. It's not two completely separate words, but it's kind of merging. That's why we also need to look a little bit in classical principles. But this lecture will focus most on this modern approach. So where do we need coding? Um, coding is necessary in essentially most ubiquitous communication systems. So the ones you know, uh, 3G, which has been switched off, which is UMTS, LTE, Wi-Fi, Ethernet, DSL, digital video broadcasting, many, many more. All of these communication systems, they use standardized codes. So they are standardized, they are written down, and you can read what's being used. But then you have many proprietary communication systems, like flash drives, hard drives, um, fiber optic communication systems. Um, they are closed systems, and they use very proprietary high-performing code, so you don't actually know what is inside unless you are able to spend a lot of fortune on reverse engineering those systems. Um, the most ubiquitous application of coding outside communication is probably data storage, both on hard drives, but also on big um, data centers where you have failures of some servers and you, you don't want the data that is stored on one server if that server shuts down or needs to be restarted because of software updates or whatever, 
you don't want this data to be missing. So you need to have some redundancy of the data you're storing into data centers. So for instance, um, if you take a look at um, your Dropbox account, in the Dropbox account, um, if your data is stored on server XYZ, and this server crashes or um, has a failure, you still want to access your data on Dropbox. And to do so, there is redundancy. So if one server crashes, you still have the data somewhere else. It's being moved to another server and you can use it. So there is a lot of ubiquitous um, storage coding in this data storage system and big data centers. So some examples of codes, um, we have uh, mobile communication systems, Wi-Fi, LTE, UMTS, um, etc. And you have coding on the one hand side to guarantee speech intelligibility, but also on the other hand, to guarantee reliable data transfer. So we have um, uh, in Wi-Fi, we use convolutional codes, which you know from Communication Engineering 1, which is a very classical coding scheme in UMTS LTE. We use turbo codes, which is kind of like a mix between a classical and a modern scheme. So it uses classical um, codes, convolutional codes, together with a modern decoder. So that's kind of some, something in between. And in new systems, 5G and the newer Wi-Fi standards, we use LEPC codes and polar codes, which are part of this lecture. And multimedia broadcasting, like digital video broadcasting, we also rely heavily on a combination of modern and classical techniques. So for instance, in DVBS2, T2 and C2, uh, we have LEPC codes and concatenated codes. Essentially, we have a combination of modern scheme and we have a classical scheme to take care of some residual errors. Um, in multimedia broadcasting, we use something called fountain codes, which is a very clever coding scheme um, that automatically has a very easy adaptation of the rate. <laughs> Sorry. Um, in optical communications, um, we need to transmit data over several 10,000 of kilometers with an optil, optical regeneration only. The signal is heavily affected by noise, nonlinear effects, chromatic dispersion, phase offsets, frequency offsets, and um, we require very, very low target bit error rates because um, the, the spectrum or part of the spectrum is rented to customers. Those customers include businesses, banks. Um, they want error-free transmission slots or virtually error-free transmission slots. And you have proprietary coding schemes that um, can be implemented in hardware with a decoder that allows a throughput from 100 gigabit per second to 1.2 terabit per second. That's on the commercial roadmap. So 100 gigabit per second you could buy 10 years ago. Nowadays, um, in a few years, it has been commercially advertised, you can buy transceivers that handle throughputs of 1.2 terabits per second. And also here we use coding schemes that are called LEPC codes, product codes, staircase codes, which we'll cover hopefully in this lecture. But we'll cover LEPC codes for sure. Product and staircase codes, we're going to take a look later. So here's an example uh, why it's important to research on new coding schemes. So this is an example of the power dissipation of an optical receiver chip. And you see that the amount of error correction uses roughly 33 to 40% of the power dissipation of the receiver. And it's the biggest, sorry again, the biggest part of the power consumption of the receiver. So in order to get this power consumption down, we need to really work on finding new and better algorithms for our coverage. So that's a research challenge. Get the power dissipation of an optical communication system down. Then data storage, as I mentioned, relies on coding. 
We require very low bit error rates on our storage devices, hard drives, SSD, um, because we don't want this data to be corrupted. And as the area that we use per bit becomes smaller and smaller, the effective signal to noise ratio becomes um, small as well, and we require coding. These are very closed systems, so usually we don't know what's going on inside. So there's one vendor, he builds such a system, you buy it, you communicate um, via an interface, and what's going on inside is completely invisible. But um, because you want to store as much data as possible on here. You don't want to store parity bits. The rate of the code should be as high as possible, meaning the number of parity bits should be as low as possible. Modern uh, drives, they employ also modern codes, like LDPC codes, product codes, and so on. Also USB drives and some solid state drives, they require coding. There we have some um, more complicated um, yeah, arrangements of codes. The data in those is typically arranged in blocks of transistor cells. And increasing the voltage of a single transistor cell is easy, but erasing it is usually not possible. So usually, uh, in order to erase the voltage, you need to insert a high, a high voltage. And that affects a complete block of transistor cells. So the erase operation typically involves copying the complete block to a spare location, erasing the block, and then copying back everything but one. And um, there was actually quite a bit of work to find specially designed codes, so-called rank modulation codes, for this. Because then, when you change bits, you only want to increase voltage levels. This is actually something that is, uh, was also very old, that came around in the 50s when you had punch cards for computers. So a punch card is actually a, a sheet of paper with small holes inside, and they were read by a um, mechanical device. So if there was a hole, means there is a one. If there was no hole, there is a zero. So you put these sheets of paper with holes to program your computer. And again, it's very easy to punch a hole in this punch card, what's called punch card, but once you have a hole, it's difficult to cover it. You need to have, uh, with tape, you need to cover the hole, it's fiddly, uh, you must not cover too much, so uh, you don't want to cover a hole, but punching new holes is easy. So already there, people have come up with very clever ideas to code the data such that when you want to store new data, you just punch new holes, but Covering holes is rarely needed. The same applies to USB drives and solid state drives, where you have very similar issues. And nowadays we can design much better codes also for this case, such that the write operation gets much faster because you don't need to shuffle around the data back and forth so much. We have seen QR codes. Um, QR codes. Um, they have error control. We can change part of the QR code. We can put an image inside that you have probably seen already. And QR code uses a very, very classical coding scheme, which are the Reed Solomon codes. And in the CCAM lecture, a big part of the lecture will be about Reed Solomon codes. The same thing is using train tickets, uh, 2D barcodes, and many other examples. If you do a wire transfer with your bank, you will also very likely use um, the code. So banking uses um, IBANs, so international bank accounts numbers, and the IBANs, they essentially have two check digits. And uh, the check digits in the German IBAN are the first two letters. So the first two letters, X and Y, after the DE are the check digits. Then you have a bank identifier and the account number. And um, so the, the idea is you have a ternary check digit X and Y. And after some conversion, the remainder after integer division by 97 must be equal to 1. And this is to prevent typo. When you type in the IBAN, you don't want your money to go to a 
different account, you want the money to go to the account where you wire it to, possibly your account, um, and uh, that's why this needs to be protected. And this essentially is the same in what happens in many other um, such schemes like IBAN, ISBN numbers, book identifier numbers, European article numbers, so the barcode that you have on any product as a code to prevent typos, credit card numbers, ident codes, tax ID numbers, and much more. Um, also, you have coding for networks. So in computer networks, coding can essentially increase the throughput in networks. And uh, you can, and we'll see an example in the Outlook, you can mitigate congestion in the network by using something called network coding instead of routing. And um, this is being, for instance, used in content delivery networks like Microsoft Avalanche. So there you can compensate for the outage of a server, you can compensate for a router that is being stuck or that is uh, overloaded with traffic, and um, network coding will increase the throughput in, in, data, um, in data networks. And there are also more esoteric applications like betting games. Um, we can use coding to design data compression schemes, just reversing the roles of encoder and decoder. Some codes have been decided to avoid the peak to average power ratio problem in OFDM. We can use coding to minimize interference multi-user communication system and um, coding is now also considered to be a key component of so-called post-quantum cryptography screens. The idea is that current public key cryptography, for instance the RSA scheme, can be broken with a hypothetical quantum computer. We have a quantum computer, there's something called short algorithm, and when you have short algorithm up and running on a quantum computer, you can break the RSA scheme that is used for public key cryptography. And that's essentially the basis of all modern communication infrastructure and networking infrastructure. And uh, in a very interesting line of work, um, multiple post quantum cryptography schemes that cannot be broken with a quantum computer yet have been developed. And one that is very powerful is based on coding. It's called the McAlley scheme. Um, we also cover it in CCAM. And uh, these new schemes, they cannot be broken yet by a quantum computer. So here is a small overview. Um, this is now really important to do because Google essentially last year claimed to have a quantum computer and uh, we have extremely rapid development of quantum computers. The first quantum computers, um, they already may beat um, conventional setups. At least that was what Google claimed more or less almost two years ago already. Um, now, quantum circuits are limited by noise. So physics is not perfect. We have noise. And also in those quantum circuits, um, there is something called quantum error correction. And quantum error correction can be formed to build this quantum computer. So without error correction, the quantum computer wouldn't be possible. Once we have the quantum computer, it can break conventional cryptography schemes and our data and security might be at risk. So therefore we, have, we need to have new quantum, quantum cryptography schemes and they are being realized using channel coding. So it's kind of weird to have channel coding make the quantum computer work. And in order to prevent the issues caused by the quantum computer, we need again channel codes. So we could have just forget everything about channel coding and not build the quantum computer at all. But I guess that's not what we want to do. So once we get to the quantum computer, we'll have issues. Uh, first, we need to build it. That's one line of research. And once we have built it, we need to prevent what it can do, which is compromise the security of our communications. For this, we need to do research on new cryptography schemes. 
So what are some prospective aspects and future applications? Um, there are many, many applications for coding, many applications, classical communication applications like um, um, channels, special channels, for instance, power line communications. It's a very nasty, nasty channel um, with smart meter um, getting more and more traction. Smart meters want to communicate over the power line. The power line is very nasty. It has very nasty noise transients. When you switch on the device, there, there's impulse noise. There's many weird stuff going on on the power line. And um, also, you may have a network at home that is using the power lines for networking. There are some devices that you just plug in into your um, power socket and you can use them as a local area network. These are very nasty channels where we require very tough coding. We have special applications uh, with synchronization failures, uh, with flash memories getting more and more dense, solid state drives getting more and more dense. We need more powerful coding because we expect more errors if we push them towards the limits. Content delivery networks, high-speed optical networks where we need to push down the energy efficiency really a lot. Then quantum computers, post-quantum cryptography, uh, many, many applications. So it's a very field that is traditional, but a field that is um, constantly reinventing itself and constantly reinventing new measures because new applications are constantly coming around the corner. So what are the cons of the lecture? So we will look at uh, some information theory. We'll not go into the deep depths of information theory. We just look at the, the bits that we need to understand and communication channels and get some limits of codes. We're looking at uh, concepts of linear channel codes. Uh, we're looking at LDPC codes, which are very powerful class of codes. Uh, we're looking at some codes for optical communications. We're looking at polar codes, which are using 5G. We're looking at coding for networks, etc. And uh, we'll add some comments to the lecture um, on, on the fly because we are, as I mentioned, we are reshuffling the contents a little bit. So to take home, coding is an essential part in any communication system. Mastering coding techniques, they are very powerful tools. They can be applied in many areas of communication engineering. We have a mathematical background that is can be challenging, but once you master it, it's a very valuable tool in many other areas of communications. With this, I'm at the end of this video. Thanks a lot for listening. And here you have again the literature. And in the next video, we are going to dive into the channels. Thanks a lot and see you in the next video.